All right, so let's get this thing started. Let's start this future of Christian TV, film, and distribution. Um, it's an interesting conversation we're going to have with Greg Gudorf and Dan Rupel. So if you've signed on, welcome to this conversation. I think we're going to have a good time. We're going to go about an hour, and uh, you'll see a chat room at the bottom of your little Zoom. Uh, and But more important, there's a Q&A button. And if you have any questions, as we're talking, jot them down and we'll take a look at them. And if we have time at the end, we're gonna answer some questions for you directly. So uh, let me just say before we get started that this event is hosted by two organizations. One is the NRB, the National Religious Broadcasters, and the other is Christians in Communication. So the NRB was founded in 1944 as an advocate for Christians who wanted to be on television, film, and today internet platforms and, and other types of telecommunications and media. It's a great organization. I'm a member, I'm on the board. And also we're having a national conference in June in Dallas. And I would encourage you to come, nrbconvention.org has all the information, nrbconvention.org. So we appreciate the NRB for sponsoring this thing. And also our partner in that is Christians in Communication. And um, that's a really an organization that wants to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to anybody interested in telecom, TV, mobile, any industry out there that's similar in that media space, they're out there trying to reach out to people and gather them together. So they've done some remarkable work. They really want to reach gatekeepers, which I think is important. And you can go to christiansincommunications.com, christiansincommunications.com to learn more about them. And you can see some of our partners, EWTN, TBN, uh, CA Communications and Associates, the TCT Network, Olympusat, the Hope Channel. We've got some great people helping make this happen today. So why don't we get this conversation going because I think it's really important. Let me introduce our two guests. Um, Greg Gudorf is the founder and the head of the Gudorf Group. He was before that the CEO of Pure Flix Digital. So trust me, if anybody knows what's happening out there on the bleeding edge of that world when it comes to Christian media and the digital realm, Greg is the guy to talk to. Very interesting guy. And he's been at this for about 30 years and is focused mostly on the convergence of how all these media platforms are coming together and the hardware to make that happen. So I'm really interested in uh, sending him some of the tough questions today that I, I want to find out. Dan Rupel is my other guest today. Uh, my wife, Kathleen, figured out years ago that we had actually seen Dan perform in college. Back then, he was a founding partner of Isaac Air Freight, which was a comedy group that toured all over the U.S. and universities and colleges and churches. He left that and became the supervising producer at CBS Television. And he was responsible for shows like The Price is Right, The Late Show with David Letterman. So he's been out there at the very forefront of national network television. Now, he left that after about a decade and started doing programming, original programming, producing stuff for a number of internet companies. So he's had an interesting combination, too, of that blend of traditional network TV and what's going on on the internet. And today, Dan is the CEO of Master Media International, a little bit of, a, a little bit of a switch, but it's a highly respected voice when it comes to faith in Hollywood. And he's trusted by major, major leaders in the industry across the board. And it's just a great organization. I've been a part of Master Media International for a very long time and I love what they do. So guys, first of all, welcome to the conversation. Thank you, thank you, Phil. Um, let me start with Greg a little bit here. I, I, here's, here's the question that I have, and I think probably a lot of listeners do. And that is, you know, when I started my career, which is probably farther than most people think away, uh, when I started my career, if you were a filmmaker, you had just a couple choices. You either had to get your movie on a screen in a theater or maybe a niche like educational film. Um, and if you were a television producer, you had the opportunity to produce a local TV show on your local TV station or try to do a national program. But today, Greg and I, in fact, Greg, you and I were list, uh, listing SVOD, TVOD, yeah. FVOD, AVOD. I mean, there's so many millions of choices out there. If I'm an independent producer, when it comes to distributing my project, where in the world do I start? Well, like any business, you have to start where the customer is, right? So the question today would be, are they in theaters in the COVID world? Not right now, that's for sure. Are they watching local TV? Local TV is in a tough spot right now. We know where they are. They're on their phone screens. They're on the internet. They're on YouTube. You know, the hours and hours of content showing up in the on-demand world, that's where they are. So again, as in any business, you've got to fish where the fish are, as the saying would go. First thing to do is figure out what customer you're trying to reach and then where are they. Then 
ask yourself, how do I produce content to reach that person at that spot? Very interesting. Well, Dan, let me ask you this. Uh, you know, the big question I get a lot is, does a producer have to have distribution locked in before they ever produce their project? You know, when, when should you start thinking as a producer about who's going to see this thing? Well, it's, it's true that as early as possible, you need to lock in distribution. Uh, we, you and I both, Phil, and I'm sure Greg too, you've seen projects where suddenly they're all done and they take it to a distributor and they go, well, I might have been interested if you would have changed this and this and this and this, and it's too late. So I would say as early in the process as possible, lock in your, your uh, distribution. But with that said, uh, two things are at play here. One, what, uh, to, to Greg's point, you need to identify the audience. Who would want to see, see this story? Who would want to see this film? That, that tells you an awful lot because it determines the kind of distributor you want to go after. But even more uh, before that, you've got to have a great story. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if you have the greatest distribution in the world. If it's not a good story, who cares? Nobody's going to want to go see it. It's not going to attract anybody. You can have the Disney machine behind it. But if the, if the, the, the story isn't appealing or won't connect or resonate with an audience, it, it's kind of all for naught. So I would say start with a great story, identify the audience, and then find the distribution as you're also finding, uh, it's kind of a chicken and the egg, funding and, and distribution. Because yeah. often a funder what, don't want to, doesn't want to get involved until you have distribution and vice versa. Yeah, and it's true that, that you, what you said is right, absolutely right on. And the flip side is, it doesn't matter how great the program is. If there's no audience for it, you fail. If there's no eyeballs to watch it, you fail. So it's kind of a combination, a mix. They're both equally important. And I don't think a lot of producers realize that because you and I both have seen tons of producers with really pretty good projects, but because they didn't have a distribution avenue, they ultimately went out of business and they never got to produce anything else. So it is a big, big question. Now, Greg, you mentioned, you know, this COVID world and how theaters are not coming back. You know, most producers, if they're filmmakers, they think, obviously, I want my movie in a theater. Or if I'm a television producer, obviously I want my TV program on a national network, but that's just not viable for the vast majority of projects out there. I mean, when you were at Pure Flix Digital, you know, what percentage of projects did you turn down versus projects you accepted? I mean, there's there's a lot of choices you have to make out there, right? Yeah, there's 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 so many choices to make. I want to ride on and add something to what you and Dan have been just talking about. Yes, the story's gotta be there. You gotta think about your distribution first because that's often tied to your funding and how you're gonna get there. The earlier you do it, the better. But if you inject some forethought about how can I repurpose this content down the road, you will considerably strengthen your position. For instance, maybe your intent is to produce a movie and I'll swing it back to the theater side. You want to produce a theater movie, uh, but if you design the content such that it could actually be four 22-minute episodes, then with very little work, you can take that same content and produce a series either after you make your distribution run as a movie or if the movie doesn't actually go the way you wanted it to you know that you have episodic content out of it. So there's a there's a, an, one extra point to the got to have your story good. You got to have your distribution lined up. Inject thinking about how can I repurpose this content? Because the reality of all of these choices that you were mentioning before, Phil, you know, going from just theater and TV to yeah. all of this internet choice is they all require different formats and different sizes. So think about that ahead of time as you build your story you can uh, create opportunity for yourself down the road. Yeah, I want to. No, I want to. Oh, go ahead. Go hey, Dan. Uh, well, I I don't want to interrupt you, Greg, but I want to I want to jump into that because you are absolutely right. And Phil, I'm going to borrow a uh, your your playbook because I know you you bang this drum. Is when we when we were asked to do this this panel webinar, we it, we said the topic is what's the future of distribution. The truth is nobody knows. That's right. You know, COVID is, the industry's in chaos. No one really knows, are the theaters ever going to open up again? Will anybody keep watching broadcast TV or are we totally a streaming or digital platform or, or whatever? So nobody really knows. But to Greg's point, and I totally agree, uh, is 
we've got to be able to pivot quickly. You've got to put your project in a, in a way, design it, it, kind of retrofit it if you can. And I realize not all things are created equal, but if you can, so you can be have as much flexibility and adapt to where the industry is going at any given time. So how do you do that? One, you keep the budget as low as possible. That gives you a lot of wiggle room. I'm not saying compromise the production, but keep that bu budget as low as you possibly can uh, and still put a good, good product out. That gives you more flexibility. Yep. Another thing you can do is, is really understand that you already have a built-in audience. It's a familiar book series. It's a, it's a, a famous uh, celebrity. It's, it's a well-known uh, historic story or, or something like that that would already have that built-in audience. But then to Craig, uh, Greg's point, exactly. If you can take it from a film to an episodic, to repurpose it in a lot of different kinds of forms. You know, we, we were talking before we got on about, about Quibi, you know, we're talking sound bites almost of, of storytelling. And then you have a, a full theatrical, which might be three hours. So if you can, and I'm not saying you can do this with every project, but if you can, what flexibility it gives you when you're pitching it to a distribution company or a studio. And you say, yeah, I've got a two hour film script or I have a completed film. But if you're more looking for episodic, I can cut this thing up and I can make six great half hour episodes. Well, there's a term that's been kind of trendy in Hollywood for the last few years called transmedia storytelling, which means your story can work on multiple media platforms, even into areas like print or comics or other things. Is that an important thing to be able to have a story that transcends one medium and can work in a lot of different places? You know, I suppose from, a, um, from my perspective, whether it was MGO or pureflix.com or the answers.tv perspective, um, those things happen, but that's not a primary focus. Much more important to have flexibility with what I can do with it. Can I feature it as a movie? Can I break it into episodic? Can I chop it for social drivers? Those kinds of things, much more important than can it also show up as a comic book or some other format. Now, I suppose the right answer would be if you can figure out how to be that um, flexible, anytime you can repurpose existing content, you are adding value to your capabilities. So yeah, if you can think that way and make those things repurposable, is that our word? It's all the better, it right? Me. It works for me. <laughs> Let me ask you this, um, Christian programming, that's kind of the focus of what we're talking about today. Yep. And certainly, uh, Greg, you had an enormous amount uh, of impact with that in, in Pure Flix. Um, what about getting that programming onto mainstream platforms? You know, Pure Flix, actually, uh, Steve Taylor actually brought up a good question a minute ago that Pure Flix was recently purchased by Sony. Yep. You know, what does that say about uh, mainstream network and organ media companies' desire to get into Christian programming? Or we've always talked about ever since, you know, Simon Swart led the march for, um, you know, faith-based films over at, over at Sony. I mean, um, 20th Century Fox years ago. Um, is that still viable to mainstream platforms? Or are they still looking for that kind of content? What's the story out there? Well, you know, I think there's good news in that. Um, remember that the church has been involved with movies for a long time, right? I mean, yeah. back in the early days, 40s and 50s, it was the Catholic and then largely the Protestant churches that censored or watched or monitored or advised on every piece of movie that came out. And quite frankly, that's why whether you were five years old or 95 years old, you can go to that movie and watch it, right? And it's only when the church has started to pull back that you can chart uh, wow. a tremendous rise in the violence and language and other issues around movies that make up mainstream movies today. The good news for us, though, is as Christians, is the Christian market is huge. You know, when we were raising funds for PureFlix when we were just getting it started, the number of VCs and other uh, financiers who would say, oh, you're serving a niche market. I would just kind of chuckle because yeah, you can call it a niche, but it is the biggest niche out there yeah. of any uh, group, right? So the good news is the audience is large. The second piece of good news is the story has lasted a couple of thousand years and it's still going strong. So that says it speaks to people at the heart level, right? 
and any story that touches the heart can get out there. It's just a matter of how you break through the, the technical distribution quadrant. Yeah. When it comes to a, a Sony buying PureFlix, you know, this, this emphasizes that there was enough of a Christian audience pursuing, here, here's, the, here's the catch with PureFlix, not just a Christian message, but a family friendly message. Um, a place they could go to, movies and shows that they would watch that would not assault them with X number of F-bombs every so many minutes, right? right? Or scenes that would make them squirm. So it again, I see it as good news. It was a Christian message. About half of the content was Christian. Half of it was family oriented. The family part goes together with that. So I look at it and go, the fact that Sony bought into PureFlix says they're recognizing a resurgence in wholesomeness or family orientation that is not being served by the typical shows on a Netflix or an Amazon Prime or you name whatever that might be. So I actually think it speaks to opportunity, but it comes back to Dan's point. You've got all those benefits going for you. You got to figure out how to have a really compelling story, not just a whitewashed retelling. Right. I think, uh, well, go ahead, Dan. Let me jump in um, because I do talk to uh, executives at studios uh, quite often. And sometimes there's this misnomer that uh, the, the mainstream film studios, uh, you know, they kind of have agenda against faith. And occasionally that's, that's the case, but they, they embrace it. And they'll tell me, they'll say, man, we want faith content because they know, to, to Greg's point, they know the Christian audience is the largest uh, people group in America. Uh, you know, it's huge. It's a huge community. And they understand that. And they see the numbers that some of the, uh, the Kendrick Brothers films, the uh, Pure Flix, uh, Affirm, etc. they see how much money they're bringing in. But what they're saying is, is bring us the great stories from your community. It can be about faith. We're not, we're not shying away from faith. Bring us the great stories, but also we wanna expand beyond your community to films that will resonate with the mainstream audience. And so you cite films like, like uh, Chariots of Fire, Hacksaw Ridge, Blindside, uh, Terrence Malick's Hidden Life, uh, Amazing Grace. Those are the stories. And what I tell uh, screenwriting students when I speak at universities is the non-Christian person is, is, is not as interested in the journey to faith. They're more interested in seeing faith inside of a person and how it plays out in their life, meaning they like to see stories, and the, the films I just cited, every one of them has this story arc. They want to see ordinary people do extraordinary things because of their faith. They, that's, that's that hook that, that Greg was talking about. I can, I can identify, even if I'm a non-Christian, I can identify with that. I understand heroism. I understand that I, I love my son so much, I'll run into that, you know, burning the house and, and save him or, or so, just like uh, the character in Hacksaw Ridge. Because of his faith and his love for his fellow man, he jeopardized his life. So those are the kinds of stories that they know will resonate with a bigger audience outside of ours. And then you've really got something. Then you've got more and more stories with a faith uh, uh, in the subtext or undergirding the story that's just gonna really explode. Now is the most exciting time for a Christian filmmaker to, to jump into the mainstream arena. I think that's really good, but I think also it means we have a real responsibility as Christian filmmakers or television producers. You know, Ralph Winter, a uh, friend of ours, produced Wolf, uh, Wolverine, Planet of the Apes, Star Trek. I, he was just most recently in Tokyo, producing an updated version of Miami Vice, only based in Tokyo, Tokyo Vice, who would have thought? And, uh, but we've had conversations many times about the fact that, you know, as soon as Passion of the Christ got Hollywood's attention and they started looking at this faith-based market, the thing that would hurt us the most is if we try to produce really poor stuff. You know, if we take them something that's cheesy, overacted, maybe overly explicit, um, you know, sometimes Christian audiences will forgive maybe overacting or cheesy storyline or some things like that. But when it comes to that, 
secular mainstream audience, they are brutal. And so I think it's just a responsibility for us as producers, as filmmakers, as creative people to when we do have that project, we think has the potential to cross over. It better be pretty amazing. It better really be able to stand up on its own because that world is not going to they're not going to make the they're not going to be forgiving like very often Christian audiences could be. So I think that's our kind of our clarion call to make amazing stuff. So would you I agree? think that under, that underscores the exact point. Hollywood is a machine. And so the metrics and the money will over trump the message alone. Whereas yeah. in the Christian side, many filmmakers think the message is the most important thing. And if I get the message really right, oh, the money will come. Hollywood yeah. won't make that bet, right? That's right. I, That's I because agree. People, people, people go to the theaters to, to, to be entertained, not to be, yeah. to be lectured. And, uh, you know, my MFA works in screenwriting. The, the message ha has to serve the story, not the, the story serving the, the, the message to, Greg, to Greg's point. And, you know, as a Christian writer, man, God created all things. So I can write about all things. You know, let's explore it. Let's not limit it to, to one little, little uh, uh, narrative and, and like that. You know, I, I talk about um, when we do a film, uh, there's the unfamiliar and the familiar, meaning yeah. when I go to a movie, I want to be introduced, transported to another world, another environment, another situation, another person that is, is different than me. I, wanted, I want that. I want that unfamiliarity like, wow, but I need the familiar also, meaning to Greg's point, it's got to connect with that universal struggle of every, every single person. Mm -hmm. I can, even though he's in a whole different setting than me, I, yeah. can, I can relate to that because that's that emotional tie. That's what, what keeps you, you know, leaning forward in the movie theater going, wow, I don't get, this is, this is amazing. You know, I can, I can find myself in that story. All right, so let, let's get back to grass, brass tacks for just a minute. I'm a producer. Um, I've got a project I want to do. Either I've done it or I want to do it. I've got the script. Um, I don't know anybody in distribution. I, I don't know who, who to go to for a, it's, it's a movie or a television program. I don't know. Even at Christian networks, I may not know anybody at TBN or TCT or other options like that or Pure, Fix, Pure Flix or now Sony or anybody. Greg, where, where do you start? What, what do you do? Yeah, you've got a tough road ahead of you um, because you got to know somebody or you have to know somebody who knows somebody to help you. Uh, the number of titles we used to get, um, you know, people wanting to, to show us their clip, show us their trailer, show us their script uh, for a movie was just an insane amount of traffic versus any projects that we actually did. And the reality is most uh, services have a submission box but I would challenge whether or not those submission boxes actually get manned because they just know that dozens and dozens a week yeah. will get sent into it that aren't, aren't real. Yeah. The sad part about that is if, if you showed up in one of those submission projects and you really had your ducks lined up and all in a row, no one's gonna see it because so many top of mind ideas get shoved into that submission process and blocks everything else from flowing. So you got to know somebody or somebody who knows somebody. And oftentimes that can come out of your financing, you know, the, the financiers behind the movies, you know, because they're the people beside you as a filmmaker, yeah. most motivated to make sure that this gets into some distribution. They just put some money into it. They want to make sure that that money comes out. So oftentimes that can be your clue, but until you have a reputation you know, the Kendricks brothers are a good example. They had a good, solid money-making reputation, and then they got their deal, right? Yeah. Until you get to that reputation level, you are going to struggle to find distribution, which is another reason why thinking about flexibility and how you repurpose your content and get your content exposed in other channels can create excitement for you that can lead to that. On the Pure Flix side, and, you know, we were like any of the services out there, there's always a small team of people whose job it is to go and constantly be looking for content. It's, it's kind of the don't call us, we'll call you kind of a thing because that person or that team is scanning for content. They know what works for their service. And when they see it, whether they find it at a, 
a film festival or on online on a YouTube or some screener site, they'll make that contact. They'll reach out and say, hey, we want that. And what you need to be ready for at that time as a, a filmmaker is the reality of what the fees and license are because your dream of millions may be very different. Well, it is very different than the reality. Yeah, uh, Greg, Greg's uh, absolutely right. Um, everything in this business happens through relationship. You, you've, you've got to get out there and get to know people. You need to go to places like NRB. You need to be wherever the industry people are and, and, and build, build relationships. But beyond that, I, I think of, uh, when I was at CBS, I worked many times with Carol Burnett and she tells a story about how when she first went to New York to try to make it, uh, she would go to try out for a play and they would say, uh, well, don't come until you have an agent. So then she'd go to the agent and they'd say, uh, don't talk to me until you're in something. You know, it's that catch 22 that, that we're struggling with. And she said, so what I finally did is she goes, I always remember the, the Judy Garland, Mickey Rooney movie. So I just said, put on a play. So she put on her own uh, in this little hall and she got some agents to come and uh, the rest is history. Look how, yeah. how she took off. Okay, let's take that to uh, 2020 uh, or 21. Uh, to be accurate now, um, we have such an advantage over what we had when the three of us were starting. Mm -hmm. You know, in, the, in really the only game in town way back then was, was three TV networks and six film studios. And you had to get past that gatekeeper and that was a, almost your only option. And to make a, any kind of reel or anything was very expensive because the equipment was expensive, right. it was large, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now we know on our phone, we can make a movie. And so I encourage anyone who is people who doesn't have their, their career already launched uh, to Greg's point, people need to be familiar with you. What do you do? Yeah. You got a great platform with YouTube or these other, other uh, uh, digital platforms, make a little film, make a teaser reel, tell a little story, get it out there, uh, start a web series. You know, we know many students who did web series at almost no cost, maybe the price of lunch. <laughs> you know, yeah. get it out there. So if you meet somebody at an NRB, you know, you can say, hey, you know, here, here's a link to my YouTube channel. Check out what I'm doing. And if it's interesting, if you're showing some talent, uh, you know, things can really open up. No, so I think that's especially true. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Greg. Especially true, Dan, I think in the Christian space, because you will find people who will fund things for that message. Even though we're talking about the importance of it being a business, yeah. if you can show a web series that's maybe it's little shorts, but it's got a really strong Christian message told in a modern way, you will find interested Christian investors who will say, you know, that's good. Even if it doesn't become a, a blockbuster hit somewhere, how much, you know, if you did that with 10,000, what could you do with 100,000? Yeah. And that's how it starts for you. And then that, that gets placement for you. That's true. You know, I've written on my blog a couple of times about professional ecosystems. And I think this is a good term within this conversation that, you know, whether it's Christian television, mainstream TV, mainstream filmmaking, there's an ecosystem there. There are people that are influencers. There are people that pull the trigger, that can green light things. There are people that can fund things. And it's interesting when I'm with a group of my friends who are secular producers in the mainstream film business, they know everybody. They know who's working, who's not working, who's, who's done the latest movie that really matters, who you need to get in front of. I'm that way when it comes to Christian television. I know that ecosystem pretty well. I know who the players are and who I need to get my project in front of. So whatever you do, I just encourage people listening right now that whatever you do, whatever system you want to be in, learn the ecosystem. It takes work. It takes some, yeah. some real research to find out who are those people. And like Dan said, go to the NRB convention this summer in June. And I mean, it's the biggest gathering of Christian professional communicators in the country. That may the, be the place you need to be to start meeting the kind of people that would make your project work. There's a million different conferences uh, in, in Hollywood, in Los Angeles, in New York for the industry. So learn that ecosystem because that's the players. That's where the people that can make your project happen are. And I, I think that's really important. The, the other thing I'd quickly say too is the value of showing your work is absolutely critical. I think if I made a big mistake early in my career, it wasn't, I, I didn't bet the farm on doing a short film or something that would really showcase 
what I was capable of doing. Early on, I got involved in client-driven work. And so I was being hired by ad agencies or nonprofit organizations, whoever, to do stuff. And that was fine. And, and I was very proud of that stuff. But, but to have a short film or some thing that you could demo to show that you're, you know, you know what you're doing and you're professional, I think is really important. And so often Christians who want to, who come to me and pitch ideas, they don't have anything to show for it. They don't, they don't have anything that, that I would be impressed by that would cause me to want to really listen to their ideas. So I think doing that kind of work is important. So let me switch gears for just briefly real quick. Rod Hopping had a great uh, question and that is, he'd love our thoughts about international distribution. Now I know some producers who never got their project off the ground because the studios felt like there wasn't an international audience for that. And today international is big. Uh, Greg, what do you think about international? Should we be thinking about a distribution all over the globe? Well, you know, there's, there's, from a distribution platform perspective, there's several things you have to think about from an international perspective. Um, in the past, and less and less now, but there's always the issue of how do I deal with a CDN, uh, content delivery network, around the globe, right? It's great that I can serve in the U.S. and I can probably yeah. handle uh, Canada and Mexico, okay, from the U.S. infrastructure, but if I want to be over in Asia or in Europe, I have to yeah. think differently about my infrastructure. And oh, I know there's different languages, but there's different currencies too. And so many times people will try to serve in the, from the U.S. with U.S. dollar. And you'll get some expansion because some people will deal with that, but you won't get the big breakthrough that you need. So before you even think about, you know, rights and things like that, you're planning, right? You've got to make sure that whoever you're talking with or thinking about working with is thought through those things. On the Answers TV service, which we stood up at the start of this COVID uh, piece, it's growing nicely now. It's got about 3,000 pieces of content and, and uh, a nice rapidly growing uh, user base. We uh, used an infrastructure that could take us international from the start, including international currency. And so now the challenge for us is making sure that we can get multilingual captions done and or source native language programming to drive it. I think if you're going to be in this Christian space, though, you must think international Christians, right? Not only is it the biggest people group, as Dan said, in the U.S., it's the biggest people group out there in many respects, right, in many countries. Uh, and we've got to serve that if, our, if that's our servant's heart at work in our, our play. We have to have international thinking. Dan, thoughts about international? Well, I remember... Um... Oh my, it was probably uh, 10, 15, no, it was about 15 years ago. Uh, I had a screenplay of, of a Christian uh, or a Christmas comedy. And I took it to a couple different uh, uh, production companies and it got really, really strong feedback. And, uh, but then it was turned down because they said most of our funding comes from international sources. Mm -hmm. And they said, Christmas doesn't play well internationally. Well, that was eye-opening to me. I, I'd never, I, you know, I, I think of things in a U.S. context, and I didn't think about that. And um, so, you know, I thought I'm either going to have to really pull back my expectations and my my budget hopes and in, in that, and just play domestically, or I need to uh, write something differently. Different. So we have to also be mindful. <clears throat> Greg covered it very well as far as the business side, and uh, the financial side, the distribution side. Uh, but we also have to understand the cultural differences. What, you know, how is it going to play in that, in that arena, uh, in Asia, in Europe, in, in Africa, which, as we all know, are huge audiences, yeah. huge, huge audiences. You know, years ago, you could take all the international film audiences uh, collectively, and it would be a minute fraction of the U.S. box office on any given weekend. And now, you know, often China trumps US and just, you know, alone. So we are a global player, digital opened it up to, to the world. And we have to just understand the cultural differences in our storytelling. That's true. So Tim Moret asked an interesting question about what if you're interested in Christian television? You know, it's funny, most, most filmmakers and TV producers you know, they're not interested in Christian television. And, and I, there's that argument, should it even exist? I get that. But my feeling is, hey, when I watch direct TV in my home, there are home remodeling channels, there are sports channels, there are gay channels, there are all kinds of lifestyle channels. 
Why shouldn't there be a Christian channel on there to show me how to be a better Christian? I'm, I'm cool with that, as long as the programming on there is really engaging and, and high quality and, want, and something I want to watch. But if you want to break into Christian television, now it's not advertising driven for the most part. It's lo- largely donor driven. Are Christian networks out there looking for things? Uh, any comment on that, guys? You know, I would uh, turn to, I think about uh, YouTube uh, as a way to start to test and see what could fly as a TV episodic. And I think episodic when I think TV, as as Dan said earlier. Um, You know, if you're donor uh, driven, donor funded, and you can get a platform that shows there's an audience, you'll get the attention of someone somewhere down the line. You know, one of the things that we've, whereas in Pure Flix, we balanced between faith forward and family, and we were striving for a 50-50 mix, you know, a service like Answers.TV is purely faith. And that's right. what it's all about. And so we've got a, a series of shows uh, that are, would fall into this TV classification where uh, a, a personality is out in the woods uh, exploring and talking about, you know, natural, uh, the natural world, but doing it from a biblical uh, point of view or working with kids in an outdoor environment and doing it from a biblical point of view. Those things make up that TV play. The catch is you got to put something together. And once you get it together, get a little traction on YouTube, get it onto a service like an Answers TV, assuming that theologically, biblical view wise, it all matches up. Then you can uh, show kind of the Carol Burnett story. Hey, I not only have content, but I have an audience that likes it. Now you're in a much better position than when it's just in your head. Too many times we want to deal when it's just in our head. Yeah, I think that's good. You know, I, a lot of producers, I was talking to a group of young producers just a week or two ago. And um, I said, you know, producing today is not about just being the creative guy. It's not about just being the business guy. You've really got to think about all these phases, whether it's raising money. You know, producers today have to be fundraisers. It's just the bottom line, whether you're getting an investment or whether you're getting an out, outright donation. But, you know, you, I think, Greg, you made an interesting point earlier. If your movie or television program is about a cause, maybe it's about human trafficking, maybe it's about any number of issues out there, hunger, whatever, find somebody that is really passionately driven by that cause and let, let's get to know those people and, and yeah. talk to them about funding because I think that's potentially really, really critical and important. So um, I think you're exactly right. Putting your stuff on YouTube, find out these platforms because we just have to, you know, I'm sorry, we can't be the creative guy only anymore. We have to be the business person, the creative person, the distribution person. We just have to think on all these levels. Yeah, Craig, or uh, Phil, to, to reinforce your, your point, um, we're seeing a, a lot of um, humanitarian projects and in, in, in documentaries, which funding can go hand in hand. You know, it's, it's, it's very interesting programming to watch someone, let's say, go to Africa and, yeah. and meet a people group that doesn't have fresh water. And they, they do they figure it out how to bring in fresh water. Well, that's a wonderful cause that can be undergirded by a lot of faith as well as it can go hand in hand with a funder of a, a nonprofit who is doing that kind of work. Maybe you even do a documentary about them doing that kind of work. And that is very compelling television. Um, to, to take this conversation or adding to it in uh, mainstream television, uh, mainstream television has changed as we all know, well, the whole media industry has radically since when we were little. When we were little, there were three TV networks and on Sunday night, Bonanza could get 80 million people watching it because there wasn't much competition. So that was the era of broadcasting programming that would appeal to a broad audience. Cable came in, it became a little bit more narrow casting, a more, a little bit more uh, divided in, in the, the fragment of the audience that they wanted, they wanted to serve. But now we're really in the niche cast. The, you know, uh, you can have a moderate hit on cable with 700,000 viewers. You know, that's a moderate hit. Uh, Even even the the big things like a Game of Thrones, uh, their their finale only had eight or nine million 
uh, viewers. So, I mean, what a difference from the Bonanza days. So what I'm saying in the conversations I have with TV uh, uh, presidents is they're saying, show me a people group that is underserved. I need to find that niche. Yeah. And the best example, and, and going back to what we all said very early, the Christian community is the biggest people group in America. But, yeah. uh, um, but the best example of this is the Hallmark Channel. The Hallmark Channel was the bottom feeder of cable network. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was in the bottom three constantly, year after year, week, month after month. No one watched the Hallmark Channel. They came in, new CEO, new programming heads, and they said, we're going to be all about, uh, by the way, they're owned by uh, the, the, uh, the, the Crown family, uh, and the Crown family is, is believers wanted to have better programming. They said, we're going to be all about faith and family. That gave birth to all those Christmas movies uh, that run, <laughs> I think they run, start running them in the summer. But, uh, you know, it all that, okay, the Hallmark Channel today is in the top five cable ratings. They're up there with CNN, Fox, uh, ESPN, uh, MSNBC. I mean, they're, they're, they're the top. In fact, they are the top cable scripted network. That's interesting. There is an audience. Yeah, there is. And, and by the way, you know, uh, Bob Higley made a great comment here on our questions about uh, the fact that Christian channels are starting to understand the power of advertising. We're seeing even TBN and some other channels are starting, you know, that didn't used to have advertising at all. They're experimenting with it. And it's encouraging to see because that means they're going to have the funding to be able to support filmmakers and television producers and try to do some unique things. So, you know, we want to just keep pushing the envelope. One, one thing, this is kind of offbeat, but one thing I think is worth mentioning is we can't overemphasize the power of casting when you take a project to a network. I, I find that very often a network or a studio, the first thing they're going to ask is, well, who's starring in that? Who's, who's in the cast in that? It's funny. We have a, one of our clients, our, our production company's Cook Media Group in Los Angeles, and one of our clients has been the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. And let me just, just say, if you haven't ever been, you need to go. It's, a, it's just an amazing, amazing thing. But we decided, you know, the Smithsonian has a channel. Other museums do some amazing programming. The Louvre has a channel in Paris. And we decided, what if we wanted to create a series of documentaries based out of the Museum of the Bible with their cura curators and the artifacts that they have? It's really kind of remarkable. So I went to some secular networks, the mainstream networks, to pitch the idea. And the interesting thing they all came back with me on was, look, we get the Museum of the Bible. We don't have a problem with that. That'd be awesome. However, what we want is a curator or somebody that would be the spokesperson who's really unusual, incredibly engaging, captivating, maybe quirky. They said, take the Duck Dynasty guys, for instance. They said they don't care if they, they're in the duck call business or if they could be motorcycle mechanics. They could be whatever. But they're such fascinating people. They're such interesting people to watch. I don't care what business they're in. We want to watch them. And so I just think that that's an important point to make. Whether you have a program host or whether it's your lead actors, they need to be really engaging because very often, even though Dan's right, that the story matters ultimately. But if you don't have actors, hosts, people on camera that can carry that off and really be engaging with people, um, that, that's going to hurt you when you go to a mainstream network. Do you find that you guys yeah. find that true too? A absolutely. You cannot ever underestimate likability, especially in a medium like television. Television, you are inviting someone in your home, so to speak. And you wouldn't open the, you wouldn't open the door for yeah. someone you don't like, you know. That's true. But but it's not just that you're inviting them in your home. You're going to go on an hour long journey with them, and you want somebody who's compelling, who's interesting, who's affable. That that you feel like you know I'm in good hands with this guy. He's going to take me for the ride of my life. This is going to be phenomenal. And so it's so important you have that good host that takes you through the journey. We were mentioning earlier not on the call before we got on it, that, you know, all, all my years uh, producing, do, supervising The Price is Right, audiences came for Bob Barker. Yeah. They loved Bob Barker. They stayed for the game, but they came for yeah. Bob Barker. He was their guide through it, through introducing the contestants, introducing the game, celebrating with them, or wah, wah, when you lose. Uh, you know, you want that. You want that friend. 
that you have in in a, in a host. You know, now, Richard Wolf asked an interesting. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Go I was going to say, Phil, it's it's easy. If you hear that, you go, well, yeah, sure. You know, if I had enough money to buy that, I would do that, right? The studio looks at it as a way to de-risk a project when you have that known face. So that's what the studio's money mindset's about. Um, it struck me, uh, Netflix of late has had a lot of foreign films that have been dubbed into English coming across, right? Yeah. So I'm looking at actors who I don't know. I mean, you know, French, uh, 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 Latin America. I don't know these actors, but several of them I saw look like or have similarities to or uh, uh, motions of famous actors that I would know as a US viewer. And I, I, I had a chuckle when I realized I was being drawn to shows who I knew nobody in it, but I was being drawn to them because something reminded me of, oh yeah, that actor, you know? So that I think is a way that a Christian filmmaker could take advantage of that. I don't have enough money for the big star, but if I can find someone who kind of has that, it gives the viewer that confidence that, ha, huh, this might be interesting. I'll invite him into my home to Dan's uh, comment. Now, Richard Wolf, Rolf uh, asked a good question about book rights. You know, in the old days, studios loved to buy the rights to a book and turn that into a movie. A, is that still a popular thing? And B, is it advantageous for me to, instead of just coming up with a story out of the blue, maybe finding a book that was a bestseller, something popular, particularly in a certain genre, would it be better to acquire that and go pitch that as a movie or TV project? What do you guys think about that? Book rights still matter? And I'm going to defer to you because from a numbers and a platform perspective, it's all about this audience and the potential financial side, but that, you yeah. would have a better view, I think. I, I would say absolutely. It goes back to what I was saying earlier about uh, a built-in audience. Uh, you are way ahead of the game if you have a, a property of a book that has maybe, you know, been around for 10, 20 years that has... Uh, maybe uh, six, seven, eight books in the series, because it tells it tells a, an executive two things. Let's say it does have six to eight uh, books. It tells them, number one, it has that built-in audience, lessening my risk. Number yep. two, and this is important, that's got legs. Mm. Yeah. You know, because when you pitch, and Phil, you know this, when you pitch a scripted show, they don't want to just hear the, the pitch, the elevator pitch. They want to, they ask you it, when you sit in that room, what happens uh, the, the uh, eighth season, second episode? They want to know it's going somewhere because if I'm going to invest in the first season, I want to know there's going to be more seasons. Yeah. The, the big money is in, you know, friends going 12, I don't know how many seasons they went, but going a long time. Cause then to Greg's point earlier, you can have reruns. So, so the point I'm making is when they know, man, there's eight books here. Wow, you could do eight seasons easily with your eyes closed, you know? So it's very important. All right, let me, let, we're about to land the plane here. We got about 10 minutes left. Let me ask you a couple quick questions. There's a couple interesting niches out there. Um, you know, Dallas Jenkins just did The Chosen and he did that through crowdfunding. He actually opened that up to anybody that wanted to contribute and that was a donated kind of a situation. And um, uh, so I want you to address that. Is that a good idea? How did it work? It seemed to work really, really well for him. Another question would be corporate sponsorship. What if, what about going to corporations, even in Christian television that I'm involved in quite heavily, we have Sunday morning church programs that I've worked with around the country that they've gone to a local business, a car dealer or a men's store or somebody else, and they got them they got them to sponsor that local Christian program. Um, what about issues like crowdfunding, corporate sponsorship, things like that? Or, are you open to those ideas? You know, uh, what Dallas did with The Chosen was just amazing. And the truth is, if you ask him what his expectation was going into that. Uh, it was, you know, maybe we'll get a little, right? Um, so it, I look at The Chosen as just proof that if you have an idea, see it through, execute it really well. I think that's the thing that made the difference for The Chosen. As soon as they saw that there was more donations coming in than they thought right from the start, 
they got on to, we've got to set this up with a drip campaign, if you will, of telling this story over time and these corporate updates and all of this process. And it paid off. It paid off to the tunes of tens plus million dollars worth of uh, funding for them. So I think, you know, I give them credit for that. But uh, I can also tell you that they, they really wondered whether or not it would work. So don't be afraid of it. Go for that, right? On the corporate side, I think the, the corporate side is a potential untapped area. Uh, and, and if I think about corporate and ministry together in particular, Dan mentioned earlier, you know, the idea for documentaries and ministries that are serving certain documentaries. But in the case of Answers in Genesis, which is the ministry behind the Ark Encounter, you know, Noah's Ark replica in Kentucky and the Creation Museum and Answers TV, a lot of the content that they're doing is sponsored by that ministry because it's a way to get the message out. That's the core job of the ministry anyways. And the channel that they take it to is an Answers TV or a YouTube or other social network. So if you can align with a corporate or a ministry that's got that kind of mentality, that's a great way, I think, to get your uh, content secured and, and get a little bit of distribution with it from the start as well. And, and um, branded content is still a big issue out there. I have a friend who in Hollywood, that's stall he does. He gets the, the, the lead actor to hold a Coke in his hand, or he gets the lead actor to drive a BMW, or he gets the lead actor to do something else. And that's, movies are driven by that stuff. In fact, he recently had a movie produced where it was entirely funded through branded content. Wow. It, was a, I, the, it was a drama that took place inside a big box electronic store and he got the store to fund the whole thing. So I think if we could be creative, it doesn't mean we're compromising ourselves as an right. artist. I think it just means it opens our eyes to some possibilities that are out there to explore those issues. Okay, so about five minutes left. Last thoughts. Dan, why don't you start? Uh, if you could say one thing, uh, last thoughts about distribution to, to Christian producers out there, what would you say? Hmm, that's, a, that's an inter interesting one. Uh, I, I would just reinforce, I think, everything we've, we've already been saying. Uh, you know, get your in distribution in, uh, in place as early as possible, but also, you know, really understand all the different things that we've talked about, the, the proper star, star, the proper story that's going to resonate with the audience you're, you're seeking, uh, what platform it should, it should go on, where that audience consumes most of their media. All those things are, are really in, important. But from a, a storytelling perspective, I would encourage anyone who's telling stories to really try to engage in the cultural conversation. As you know, Phil, I've been part of the Windrider Forum at the Sundance Film Festival for 17 years. Yeah. We take 250 students from 35 universities to Sundance every year for a conversation of faith and film. There we're seeing stu you know, you know, young people coming in with unbelievable films that are really tying into the cultural conversation of the day and the church has to be involved. Christian filmmakers have to be involved in the current cultural conversation. That's really, really good. Greg, what would you leave them with? You know, I think uh, we talked uh, on the repurposing side and the idea of you know, taking that uh, 90 minute movie and making sure that you can easily cut it into four pieces for a mini episode kind of approach. I think the repurposing is smart, but I think the challenge that goes beyond that or that underscores the repurposing is to get good at putting your message and your story into very short pieces. Uh, Quibi uh, is gone as a business, uh, but you know, Roku bought the catalog. And the reason for that is those short episodes, which were often eight to 12 minutes, right? As Dan said, a soundbite in a movie yeah. world, right? Those are a powerful way, I think, that the, the audience is embracing content now. And more importantly, you know, how many times have you watched a movie and you recognize it's long just because they didn't have enough sharpness to their focus to get it in less minutes, right? The fact that you're going to produce a movie doesn't give you that uh, freedom to go unfocused. If anything, it puts more pressure on your focus skills. So I'd encourage people to really try short, short. If you That's can good. do a 12 minute and you can hit it out of the park, I'll trust you with 22. And if you can do 22... Yeah. Okay, right? 
Yeah, that's good. Well, yeah. you know, along that line, the thing that I think is shaking up Hollywood right now as much as anything is the success of YouTube stars. The fact that there are people today producing five minute weekly programs in their parents' basement or a spare bedroom that have 40, 50 million weekly subscribers. And Hollywood just can't figure out what to do with that because sometimes they work in a movie setting, sometimes they don't. How do you translate that? But the fact is these are people that started with nothing. My grandson's crazy about this Ryan kid uh, that has just, he, I think he made $22 million off, off, off YouTube last year. Um, Finding that niche and finding an audience for that niche is really, really remarkable. So the bottom line is there's a way. Keep pushing the envelope and keep trying. And I really appreciate everybody that was involved. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Greg, for being involved today. And thanks the audience for coming. And I want to especially thank the National Religious Broadcasters, NRB, and Christians in Communications. Go to nrbconvention.org or go to christiansincommunication.com. Find out more about those guys. And I'm Phil Cook, and I appreciate you being on. And thanks so much. And we'll see you next time. Thank you all.